Hey, so today we're going to talk about differentiation of a scalar function of a tensor variable. This will be our last lecture on differentiation. Then we'll do one on integration and move on to kinematics. So this is section 3-4 in the uh, textbook. Pretty short one. All right. So let's say we have a function psi of t, like this. All right, so it's equal to, or rather it is a function that maps lin v, so the space of second order tensors, to a real number. <clears throat> but it's not necessarily a linear map from lin v to r. Um, it can be nonlinear. So that means it's not necessarily in the dual space to lin v, which is lin v itself, since there's an inner product there. Um, on the other hand, the derivative of psi with respect to a uh, tensor variable would have to be in the dual space to lin v, which would then be <coughs> in r. Uh, in, in, yeah, it would be a second order tensor um, in the dual space to lin v. It's derivative. All right, so this is uh, for t. Right, so the the space of the tangent space to lin v is itself lin v, right? So you can get from one second order tensor to another by adding their difference. And so in that sense, lin v is kind of the same as rn. Actually, if v is an n-dimensional vector space, lin v is the same as rn squared in a lot of ways, which you're probably familiar with. <clears throat> OK, so, so we know that the derivative, partial psi, partial t, is going to be a second order tensor because it's something that takes a second order tensor and returns a real number. And we know that second order tensors do that um, under the inner product. So in other words, um, we have like C of T plus delta T. You'll forgive my complete ineptitude at pronouncing Greek letters. Um, having never been a member of fraternity, I couldn't actually tell you how that fell is pronounced. So 
I'll try to pronounce it the same way every time, but no guarantees. All right, that one minus it evaluated on t <clears throat> by the definition of the derivative is equal to partial psi. That's probably a good way of pronouncing it. Good enough, right? Partial t um, evaluated at t. Um, inner product delta t. So that's the way that we're understanding the derivative <clears throat> here is that it works under the inner product on the displacement in lin v. Um, and then plus things that go to zero faster than our perturbation there. So that should be getting to look pretty familiar in terms of our definition of the derivative. <clears throat> so if the tensor T here, that guy, is a function of a single scalar variable like time or like curve length or something, then we can use the chain rule like this. Ugh. That's an ugly looking one, huh? All right, we'll fix that. Whole thing, time derivative right there, <laughs> is equal to the partial derivative. In fact, I suppose we don't have to call it partial derivative. We could call it the regular derivative because it's a univariate thing, but it's a tensor variable. Um, but I wrote it with a partial derivative everywhere, so I'm going to keep writing it with a partial derivative everywhere. But um, understand that psi here is a function of the tensor variable, <coughs> and it's a function of a single tensor variable, which is a function of time. So this derivative really is not in the partial sense, but... Um, I wrote it that way in my notes, and I'm just going to keep writing it that way, or I'm going to mess it up. All right, so this is the chain rule says it's the partial derivative of psi with respect to its argument. Inner product, the time derivative of its argument. So that makes sense enough. That's how the chain rule always works. <coughs> This, um, this formula here gives us like a pretty handy way of calculating the derivative of psi with respect to its argument um, when we can come up with this part here. Um, and sometimes, like, you remember we came up with an expression for the time derivative of the determinant of an invertible tensor function two lectures ago. Um, so we're going to be able to use that to figure out the derivative of the determinant with respect to the tensor itself. So <clears throat> now that we've established that, um, you know, and all of this psi was kind of, it operated on any old tensor. Now let's talk about restricting psi to only operate on symmetric tensors. So let 
Yeah, that'll rate really well, huh? <coughs> Let psi now be defined as a function that maps only the symmetric subspace of V to real numbers. So its domain is just sim V. And it's mapping sim v to real numbers. So its domain is restricted to symmetric tensors in lin v. <coughs> and we recall that sim v is actually a vector subspace of lin v. And in the case where v has dimension 3, sim v has dimension 6, and skew v has dimension 2. So... <coughs> That's pretty nice. We've restricted the dimensionality of things. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit here. All right, so, so one cool thing about the fact that the space of symmetric tensors is a vector space is that its tangent space can be identified with it itself, right? So in other words, if we have the, the derivative of a scalar function of a symmetric tensor, that derivative is necessarily going to be a symmetric tensor and not a general tensor. Um, <clears throat> a contrast to this would be, for instance, we had established that the derivatives of, <clears throat> of orthogonal tensors or proper orthogonal ones, so, you know, rotations, that, that derivative is, is not well, for one, the, the space of orthogonal tensors is not a vector space. It's a what's called Lie group. And so, you know, you can't add them together and get another orthogonal tensor. And so we had kind of shown that their derivatives, when the dimension of V is 3, um, are related to axial vectors and skew-symmetric tensors. So in fact, the derivative of an orthogonal tensor is related to a skew-symmetric tensor, which makes it a bit of a pain. Here, on the other hand, we have a nice vector space. And so derivatives of things with respect to that vector space, they live in something involving that vector space, which is pretty darn nice. All right, so we can define a related scalar function. So we have psi here that operates only on sim v. We can define a related scalar function, which we're going to call uppercase lambda, which is like not one of the Greek letters I'm better at drawing. I can draw a lowercase lambda for you. This one's going to look real stupid like it was drawn by a kindergartner. Um, I did pass kindergarten, by the way. But, <clears throat> you know, oh well. See, I told you. That one turned out better than usual. All right, so we're going to define it to be equal to um, psi 
Yeah, that's how I'm pronouncing that today. Of F transpose F. <clears throat> uh, this is for all F in Lin V. Or good, be, right, because F transpose F we established in one of the previous lectures. Um, in fact, the one on the polar decomposition, we showed that that is symmetric. And so, you know, psi here only operates on symmetric tensors. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool that we made its argument a symmetric one since it wouldn't mean anything otherwise. But now this one here, this lambda, is defined for all tensors in Lin V. Now, you might be looking at this like, ah, yeah, but, but we can't do this necessarily for any old lambda, right? Because it's not always going to be the case that lambda has this functional form. Maybe lambda does something to this skew-skeometric part. And that's indeed true. That can be the case sometimes. And well, doesn't that stink? I guess this formula here is not going to work too well for that. But you know, the, the chain rule that we established above here will always work for that, regardless of whether it's symmetric, skew symmetric, or anywhere in between. So that's good. And when we get to the, the bottom of this whole lesson and start using this to <clears throat> derive derivatives of things, you'll see what I'm talking about. But um, in general, it turns out, and we already kind of showed this before, that the algebra and calculus of, of symmetric tensors is like way nicer because they have this whole spectral decomposition going on. And so what we're going to do is we'll relate taking derivatives of something that operates on general tensors, you know, a scale or function of it. And if you have another scale or function of something that takes, you know, argument of tensor transpose that tensor, um, which is symmetric, it might be easy to differentiate this one. And then we can use that to like find the derivative of this, which would otherwise be difficult. One place that that'll happen is um, if this is the strain energy density function, say, <clears throat> and this is exactly this, where F is the deformation gradient and F transpose F equals C is the right Cauchy green deformation tensor that we'll get to in a little bit. And that's kind of like, uh, it factors pretty heavily into nonlinear elasticity theory. You'll see. <clears throat> I don't know that we'll have time to get to nonlinear elasticity theory in this one, but we might at least establish a little bit about it. All right, so for notational brevity, We'll define the tensor C as F transpose F. And put a little colon there showing that we're defining it. All right, so preview. In the case where F is the deformation gradient, C here is the right Cauchy green deformation tensor, which is related to the strain. I mentioned that about 30 seconds ago, but there you have it. Those are my notes. Where do the letters go? There we go.
All right. Well, <clears throat> if we have lambda and psi as defined above, where f is a function of a single scalar variable. Then it follows that, you know, the time derivative of these two has to be equal, or, um, you know, they'll pretty rapidly become unequal. You think I can like copy that and just where to go? Hey. All right, so there you go. The two time derivatives have to be equal. Pretty deeply suspicious of this whole technology thing, but that was pretty cool. Only had to write it once. All right, so if that's the case, then, um, then the derivative of lambda <coughs> of f with respect to f, inner producted with the time derivative of f, right? So we're saying that this here is equal to this here, which we established earlier by the chain rule, is equal to partial psi of c, where c is f transpose f with respect to C, inner producted with C dot, <clears throat> all right, well, C dot, we can use the, the product rule on F transpose F, and that is equal to partial psi of C with respect to C. That's not actually a partial derivative, but, you know, I started writing them that way, so it's going to stay that way. Inner producted with the sum of the time derivative of F transpose, which is equal to the transpose of the time derivative times F plus F transpose F time derivative. <clears throat> well, one thing to think about is that C and therefore C dot are symmetric tensors. Um, so this sum here is symmetric, but F is not symmetric necessarily. <clears throat> and so F dot is not necessarily symmetric. So, you know, each of these two individual terms are not necessarily symmetric, but their sum has to be. All right, so, so because we've restricted um, the domain of psi to be symmetric tensors, then, you know, perturbations in symmetric tensors, and therefore the whole derivative, can only be symmetric tensors. <clears throat> so it follows that partial psi, partial c, is a symmetric tensor. 
and I'm going to show in a little bit, but you know, the, if it weren't, if it were a general tensor, the skew symmetric part of it wouldn't do anything if you restricted yourself to it only operating on symmetric tensors. So you'll remember from a few lessons back that um, S tensor inner product W tensor is equal to scalar zero <coughs> for all S in sim V for all W in skew v. So in other words, the inner product of a symmetric and skew symmetric tensor is always zero. So the inner product of a symmetric tensor with any old tensor is the same as the inner product of the symmetric tensor with the other tensor's symmetric part. All right, so therefore, Uh, the derivative of psi, which only operates on symmetric tensors with respect to C, inner product any old tensor A is equal to partial psi, partial C, inner product sim A. And that is for all A in Lin V. And let me change my notes there. For some reason, they say that A is in Sim V, but that's stupid. <coughs> all right, so we have C is equal to F transpose F. So C dot is equal to by the product rule F dot transpose F plus F transpose F dot. All right. So we can say that partial psi of C. Partial C, inner product F dot transpose F plus F transpose dot. Well, the inner product is linear, so we can split that up into two terms, is equal to Unless anyone get any dirty ideas in their head, let's put that in parentheses before we decide to do something silly with that inner product. You can never use too many parentheses, it turns out. All right. 
<laughs> so we've just kind of, you know, distributed that derivative to the sums in the inner product there. Well, since uh, partial psi partial c is symmetric, we have this. Whoa, now. There we go. That went away. Um, partial psi, partial tensor C. Inner product, any old A, is equal to the D psi. DC inner product a transpose, right? Because it only cares about the symmetric part, and that's for all a in Lin v. All right. So if we look at um. The transpose of F dot transpose F well that's going to be equal to we only need one equals F transpose F dot <laughs> so partial psi partial c inner product c dot is equal to 2 partial psi partial c inner product parentheses, let's write C, well, we're going to combine the two terms with uh, the fact that we only care about their symmetric part, um, F transpose, F dot. And so now what we're going to do is use the definition of the transpose to move the transpose over to, well, F transpose over here, and it'll just be regular old F. So that is equal to 2 F partial psi partial C inner product F dot. And that is equal to partial derivative of lambda, which takes any old tensor F, its derivative with respect to F, inner product, F dot. <coughs> All right, so we can like, you know, these two things here are equal. We can subtract one another and then factor out the f dot inner product there, and that whole thing has to be equal to zero. So the derivative of lambda of f with respect to f minus 2 times the derivative of psi of c with respect to c, all inner product, the time derivative of f, is equal to scalar 0 because it's an inner product for any tensor function. of t.
Well, any, you know, provided that f is differentiable in time. So f dot has to be something, you know, it can't be like infinity or everything breaks. <clears throat> and so this is with, um, with c is equal to f transpose f, which we already established, but we'll write it out. And scalar functions of tensor variables, lambda and psi, that are related by the following. See, see, I told you, I can't make a good lambda. You gotta do it again. At least not a capital one. You can draw the lowercase one all day. <laughs> there we go. All right, so lambda of f is equal to psi of f transpose f for all f in lin v, the space of second order tensors operating on v. <coughs> So the, um, the textbook, when it's doing the next step of the proof, does this like, I mean, it's a valid argument um, where they assume a particular functional form of f. They say, well, let's consider f of the form f equals f naught plus a times where a is a tensor times t minus t naught. <laughs> and then if it holds for that, you know, because f is arbitrary, if it holds for that, then, you know, if we can already say what it has to equal for f of that form, then that's just what it has to equal. Um, but actually, some other times, maybe not in this class, but when you go and do, like, principle of virtual work for, I don't know, say you're setting up beam vibrations or something, um, you'll often take advantage of the fact that if it holds for any function of time, then the function value and its time derivative are arbitrarily assignable at any given time, you know, because <clears throat> it's for any function of time. So you could always pick some function that has a given value and a given time derivative at any instant. And in fact, you could usually pick infinitely many ones. And so I think I prefer the other argument because it uh, it doesn't depend on a functional form of f. It just really is saying f has to be differentiable at a time. Um, so we'll use that argument here. But, you know, it the everything else is exactly the same. I think it just is more consistent with what you'll what you see out there. All right, so we'll write that out. Ooh, watch this. So in my notes, I have the inner product above, but in my this thing, I can say, no, come back. Since that whole thing there holds for any 
arbitrary tensor function of a single scalar variable, f of t, It follows that at any time t naught, f and f dot are independent of one another and can be assigned arbitrary values. You know, of course, you'd have a different f t, but this has to f of t. But regardless of your choice of f of t, as long as it's differentiable with respect to time, this has to hold. So, like, just pick one that has that value and that derivative. We'll call the time of interest t sub 0, t naught. They can be assigned arbitrary values while this inner product up here still has to hold. So like I said, the book focuses on f of a particular functional form. is equal to some arbitrary constant f naught, <coughs> which is a tensor, plus t minus t naught, and they just pick some tensor a with f naught and a arbitrary. Which, by the way, I guess if you haven't done math things, you're like, this not thing, what the heck's he talking about? Um, you know, you'll hear mathematicians say that sort of thing, and if you've never seen it written out, you're like, what in the heck? What does that even mean? Like, it's pronounced, or rather written, Phonetically, it's like F uh, N A U G H T, like not like naughty, which is related to you know nothing. Um, so that's where it comes from when you hear people say that. Um, I don't know if you care, but you'll hear people talk about it. That's what they're getting at. Um, so now you know if you didn't before. All right, so instead of approaching it from like this particular functional form thing, because we're not actually, when you're talking about the derivative, you don't care about the long-term behavior of it. You know, we don't care that it's equal to this in the, the long term. We only care that it's equal to that, like if we zoom in really close to t naught. 
my face is really close to the screen now, but you can't see that. So, you know, it, it's not to say that f takes this functional form. It's really just to say that um, if you get real close to t naught, f takes this functional form, which is just to say that f is differentiable. So in light of that, and in light of the things that you'll run into other places, especially like beam vibration, I'm going to suggest that we just say that the value of f and its time derivative, if f is an arbitrary function of time, then those two are arbitrarily assignable and independent of one another at any time t naught. And that is the argument that you'll hear anywhere else. So that's what we're going to do. <coughs> that in a little whoop. Put it up here. So I suggest looking at it instead as f of t where f is any old function of time. It can be as nonlinear as you want. Well not so nonlinear, you can't differentiate it, but you know, you can differentiate it. F of t is equal to F of t naught, where that's some value that we've picked, or rather the value at time t naught plus its time derivative evaluated at t naught times the scalar t minus t naught. And of course, this is a scalar here, so it doesn't matter whether it's left or right multiplying f. It's not like tensor acting on a vector. And then plus things that vanish faster than the magnitude of t minus t naught. So where f t naught and f dot evaluated at t naught are independent and arbitrary. All right, so at any rate, just like in the case of vectors, <coughs> vector spaces specifically that are equipped with an inner product, um, actually, lin v, you know, the space of second order tensors, is itself a vector space, and it is equipped with an inner product. So it sort of follows that anything that works on an inner product space would work here. Um, we have this.
Um, so we said that <coughs> if the inner product of some vector with all other vectors is zero for any arbitrary choice of other vector, then that vector has to be zero. Well, since lin v is a vector space with an inner product, it follows that um, if a tensor inner product t tensor is equal to scalar zero for all t in lin v, uh, that is the case if and only if a is equal to tensor zero. <laughs> so, all right, that uh, if we go all the way back up to here, doo -doo -doo, that is pretty far back up, you know, this here. So f and f dot are independent. So this thing depends only on f, and this thing depends only on f dot, sort of trivially so. Um, well, this is independent of this. So this dot, any old vector has to equal, or dot, like tensor inner product, has to equal scalar zero for any tensor that you inner product it with. Well, then this whole thing has to equal zero, which is to say that this partial lambda partial f has to equal, I feel like I'm missing a, uh, oh yeah, two partial psi partial c. Um, regardless of your choice of f. I feel like I'm missing an f in there though, gotta say. Yep, sure am. Let's put it back in where it all, don't do that. All right, so there is, yeah, you see how, um, what happened is I missed that F when I copied the, uh, the equation. So let's put that in there. And we'll put that in there as well. All right, so that ought to <coughs> sort it out for us. Let me make sure I didn't, like, miss it somewhere else there. No, we're good. All right, sorry, I expected if we were in actual class that uh, one of you probably would have caught that and it wouldn't have gone unaddressed for so long, but that's the thing you run into with COVID times, huh? All right, so, so as a result, the derivative of lambda, our function that takes any old tensor argument with respect to its argument is equal to 2f <coughs> times the derivative of psi, which is prissy and only takes symmetric tensor arguments with respect to its argument with f in lin v and c equal f transpose f. Um, and so right now, this probably seems like kind of dumb. You know, why is this any different? Like, what makes this thing more easy than this thing? Um, so it probably looks kind of dumb and convoluted and whatever you're ever going to do with it. But if you remember back to the part of this course on tensor algebra, you probably remember that like symmetric tensors had 
a lot of pretty cool things that you can do with them, like spectral decompositions and eigenvalues relating to principal invariance and all that. Um, so it turns out that if you need to do some sort of differentiation or anything, sometimes it's a lot easier to do it with respect to a tensor one, or to a symmetric one. And, um, you know, so if you have a general scalar function of a tensor variable, you might describe a different scalar function of symmetric tensor variables that act on, you know, F transpose F. And you might be able to get this, and then you know that you just have to do 2F times that to get this one, where this one would be otherwise pretty intractable to calculate. Um, but also, without any of that, this formula way up yonder ends up being pretty useful, which is just the chain rule, um, <clears throat> even higher up. Yeah, this one right here. All right, so this here, even without any of that other stuff, we'll use that other stuff when we start doing uh, strain energy or like dissipation inequalities, but... This one here will be useful for doing exercise one in this uh, section here, which will conclude the lecture. So exercise one. In section three, four. So we're going to let A be an invertible second order tensor and so the exercise says bearing in mind equation 3.3, three, which we'll write out a little bit here. Mimic the argument used to establish Equation 3.32 to arrive at the following identity. <clears throat> the derivative of the determinant A with respect to the tensor A itself is equal to the determinant of A times A inverse transpose, which you <clears throat> hopefully remember at this point is the cofactor of A. Um, all right, so let's list what 3.3 .3 was, since I imagine you don't have like photographic memory of the textbook. Don't remember, don't worry too much about it. I don't have photographic memory either. I have barely any memory, so, you know, we're on pretty equal footing there. Or maybe you're better off. So the time derivative of the determinant is equal to the determinant times the trace of f dot f inverse. <laughs> now 3, 3 also had another, you know, it had two equations. Um, it gave you also, you know, the time derivative of the inverse. Um, we're not going to use that one, so let's not list it. I feel like writing it. All right, so recall that A tensor inner product B 
was defined as the trace of A transpose B, which can be shown to be equal to the trace of A B transpose. All right. <coughs> so then uh, let's do this. The time derivative of the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of A times the trace of A dot A inverse. Well, that is equal to debt A, A dot inner product A inverse transpose. And because the inner product is symmetric, that is, I don't even know why it did that just there. That is, maybe the pencil is running out of battery. That is equal to debt A, A inverse transpose inner product a dot <coughs> for all a invertible. Well, we just showed at the beginning of the lesson by the chain rule that the time derivative of debt a is equal to, right, so the determinant is a, a scalar function of a tensor variable. So it's got to be the derivative of the determinant with respect to its argument. Inner product, the time derivative of its argument. And if we um, compare this with this, then we're going to end up with uh, the derivative of the determinant of A with respect to A is equal to the determinant of A times A inverse transpose, which I hope you remember is equal to the cofactor of A. All right, so that concludes the lesson for today. Um, we've kind of been in the discussion talking about, you know, the lecture format and the class format and whether you would prefer more examples or keep things going more in line with exposing the textbook material. And I was a little surprised to find that, um, you know, a lot of you actually in, seem to prefer me running through the textbook material more in depth um, and found from the mid-semester, you know, evaluation of the course that some of you, uh, you know, thought the textbook was pretty advanced and, and I can see that. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose that we will kind of go through the textbook more in detail. And um, in the discussion, one of you suggested maybe that I run through some of the examples and post them in PDF format to the Canvas page so that you can go through the examples and see how the homework ought to be done. Um, and I think that's a great idea. I don't know that I'll type them up. Um, because just like when you go to type it up, it takes me a pretty long time to type it up. But we'll see. I'll try handwriting them. Um, I, I appreciate that my handwriting on this iPad is not like super ideal. They're pretty hard to write on. So if you guys have trouble reading my handwriting on this, let me know and I will type them up. But, you know, it takes a little longer. That's all right. Um, I did, you know, we, we put in that mid-semester... 
sort of evaluation of the course thing. Um, about half of you filled it out, so I'm hoping that the other half of you who didn't is just because you're pleased with the way that things are going. At any rate, there was like a pretty good spread of opinions in the, uh, the feedback for that. So, you know, I, I think prob the six people, you know, there's 12 of us in the course, 12 of you, I suppose, 13 if you count me. Lucky number. Um, but yeah, I'd say I got like four responses that were like pretty positive. And of those four, I think two probably included some, uh, you know, like sentences talking about the class. And one of you, yeah, I'll get a better microphone that I can actually turn my head away from when I have my allergy problems. I uh, just have basically iPod headphones, you know, so the microphone is sort of stuck to the mouth. But you're, you're right, I should get one that is a proper microphone. Um, and there were a couple other, you know, normal or good things there. And then a couple, literally a couple of you too, kind of had a a negative or slightly negative to extremely negative view of the class. Um, and of course, I do not get your names on these um, and I don't ask for them. Although I would say that, uh, you know, if you have something negative to say about the class, you can say it to me. I like, I'm not a, a proud person by any means. And this class is not something that I have to do. I am a research professor for applied research lab here. And so, you know, I, I ask to teach because I enjoy teaching and hope that I do an okay job of it and want to give you folks as positive an experience and teach you as much as I possibly can. And you know, I spend 40 plus hours a week doing engineering research. This is something that I do on top of it. Um, and if you saw what I got paid to do it, it would be, uh, you'd laugh pretty hard too for the whole teaching thing. So I'm definitely not doing it for the pay. I'm doing it because I want to make a positive difference in your folks' engineering career and let you interact with and learn from someone who does engineering research almost exclusively. Um, so, so those of you who had like something negative to say, I mean, for one thing, know that, well, one, you didn't say anything in words. Um, so I, I don't actually know what to do and I would like to accommodate you, you know, so please feel free to, you know, email me or if you're uncomfortable, um, I'll reopen let you resubmit that, that quiz there if you'd rather do it anonymously. But please do fill out something in the comments. For instance, one of you said you were strongly dissatisfied with the pace of the course. Um, I would love to find a way to make it work for you, but I don't know whether that means that you want the course to go slower or more quickly. And you know, there were also students who were strongly satisfied with the pace of the course. So I don't really have any idea what you'd like. And, you know, for one thing, the mid-semester reviews have no bearing on <clears throat> what, like, SRTE score I get out of this class. Um, it's just something that I implemented to try to give you folks what you want out of the class and make sure that it's actually meeting, you know, your expectations because your tuition money, whether you're paying for it directly or it's being paid for research that you're doing, in which case it's like an opportunity cost for you, you know, you're, you're paying dearly for the opportunity to do graduate school. And so I want to make sure that you're getting what you expect out of it. So, you know, if, if there's something that you'd like to see differently, please do elaborate on it. And I'm not going to, you know, knock points off your grade or anything. I'm not here to 
retain as many points for me from you as possible. I want you to learn the material, and if you learn the material, I want you to have an A and get as good an experience at Penn State as you possibly can. So that's all. Um, and we'll get on next class for integration, and we'll start looking at how differential volume elements and area elements deform, and pretty soon we'll be doing some real continuum mechanics. All right, have a good one, everyone.